This is ST536. I'm Rob Hepler. And uh, this uh, introductory lecture I'm going to cover today on everything we're going to cover, kind of give you an overview of information technology, <clears throat> and uh, just give you some uh, hints on what I think about this topic and how I'm going to cover these topics. There's a separate lecture where I talk about why I think this is important. So this is going to be more, um, a little more basic than that, and not as conceptual as that lecture. So this is your introduction to computers, or as I call it, information technology. <clears throat> um, one of the things I want to point out on this slide is this concept, computer literacy. It's an important concept. It's something we all have to think about. And most, we all use computers. Anybody taking this class is obviously using a computer. Um, but the idea of computer literacy is an important social issue as well, because here's a statistic you may not know. 60% of the world does not even have internet connectivity. So when we talk about uh, the computer age and computers are everywhere and those kinds of issues, well, that's true amongst developed nations and amongst the computer literate. Those that don't have those aspects of, of, of technology are at a disadvantage. <clears throat> so it, it is something to think about, that computer literacy is a job skill. And that's kind of one of the reasons we do, we're doing this course. And we're going to cover these other topics as well. And notice down here, this is one of my, uh, I guess, pet peeves. The Internet and the World Wide Web are two different things. The Internet is the backbone that carries things. The Web uses the Internet. And I make that distinction because there are so many other things that use the Internet. And the Internet's been around longer than the World Wide Web. And I was around, believe it or not, before there was a Web. And uh, there was an Internet, however. We used it in similar ways we use it now. But we didn't have <coughs> such a ubiquitous and, um, internet as, as the web is now. And so let's just, just move on ahead. Computers, what are computers? This is a summary kind of class, introductory class. It's an electronic device. It operates under the control of instructions stored in its own memory. It, can a computer think? No. Can a computer do much of anything? Not really. It follows the instructions that are given to it. That's about all a computer can do, no more, no less than that. It does these things, I, P, O. You've heard that in the news for um, initial public offering for companies like Google and Facebook. But in this context, it means input. We get stuff. We process stuff. And then if we don't give, output it to a human being, in most cases, the computer isn't doing anything. So output's the, really the goal of all computers, to get information, which is processed data, to a human being. Now, what the computer does is up to human beings. Human beings have to decide what they want the computers to do. Com human beings have to then tell the computer what to do. And, computer, and human beings have to give the computer the data to work with. So the computer is a tool. And I, I'm going to make that point over and over. It's nothing more than a super advanced hammer, if you will. It's a tool. What you do with the computer is entirely up to us as human beings, how we design the computers, how we, what we make them do, how we design uh, the processes they do, the programs they do, the speed of the chip, all of those things are pertinent to human beings. But the computer is just basically a, t a hammer. It's a tool. Here's an example of data. You go to the grocery store. You buy these things. You, well, you don't buy them yet. You put them in your cart. You move up to the front to the cash register. And so this is the input. This is the I. This is the O, the output, or your receipt. And on that receipt, it's itemized. All the items you purchased. So how does that happen? Well, there's a process in the computer that tells that to happen. And here's what we call an algorithm, which is a procedure. So a human being has to sit down and create an algorithm. That's how a program starts, with an algorithm. <clears throat> 
And that algorithm is in near human speak. Com compute each item's total price by multiplying the quantity ordered by the item price. Let me give an example there. That means nothing to the computer. However, the human has to go through this process. How exactly do we get a receipt? You ever thought about it? What do you have to do? What is the process? And then, of course, organize the data, sort it in some way. Usually, it's in the order things are scanned. <clears throat> and notice it puts, doesn't put a line item for each. It just puts a quantity here, for instance, the medium sodas. And then sums, all total price determined to order total due from customer and calculates the change. Now that total, in many cases, may include taxes. Some st many states don't charge taxes on food. New Mexico doesn't. Um, but you might also have discounts, coupons, that you subtract things. And there's a lot going on there. There's a barcode on each product at the grocery store. Those, they look like a bunch of bars together. And those are scanned into the computer. The coupons also have barcodes. And the product on the coupon has to match the product you purchased, and then you get the discount. It automatically happens in the computer. So there's other processes going on here. This is a very basic process we're talking about here. But this is the algorithm, which a programmer then puts into a, a more arcane, a higher level language, it's called, um, a language the computer closer to what the computer understands. And that's put in a file called a source code. And I'm getting a little ahead of the game here, but I just want you to hear these terms right now. Don't worry too much about them. We're going to talk about programming later. But the source code is a list of instructions in, a near, in, in near English, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, most programming languages are in English, um, that is then taken by another program and turned into something the machine understands. So you have an algorithm. You write a program from the algorithm, turn it to machine instructions, and those become the P, if you will. I, P, O. Input, process, output, pro all handled and decided upon by the humans. Us humans, I should say, not the humans. So the components of a computer, what makes up a computer? This is your introductory summary class. Most of you know this. So we're just making sure we're all on the same wavelength here. There's input devices, obviously. Output devices. You know what those are. Your monitor. Piece of paper might be output. Mostly it's our monitor these days. We get most things online. A system unit. Now that's the box, the computer box that you can pick up and carry around for your laptop. It's, it's the part that's not the monitor, although a desktop for a Mac, it's all one unit. The monitor and the system unit is all included. Most, most of the desktops, there's a box that other things are attached to called the system unit. And inside there, there's a CPU and a bus and ports, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to talk about all those later. But that's the basic heart of the computer. Anything outside of this is considered a peripheral. A peripheral device, or a peripheral object. Input devices are actually peripherals in most cases. However, they run into the system unit. Output devices are peripherals, but they are connected to the system unit, and that's where the output is displayed. This is the P. This is the I. This is the O. And many people call, actually list I, P, O, and then also storage, IPOS. Storage is another uh, area people talk about. Storage, of course, is where we put results of processes and where we store data and where we store instructions or programs, as they're called. So all of those things are stored somewhere in a computer system. <clears throat> For your desktop PC, everything's stored there in the system unit or in peripherals. You may have an external disk drive or something. Or we're even getting to the point where a lot of our data is stored up in, the, in a cloud somewhere on the internet. And finally, there's communications devices. And everybody has one of those if they're talking to the internet. Because you need a device to talk to the internet. It isn't automatic. And you have um, a network card, it's called. And it'll talk to the internet based on spe specified, very specifically defined 
commands, very specific, specifically defined instructions, very specific messages back and forth between your computer and some other computer elsewhere. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about networking, which is how computers talk to each other within a building or outside a building. And then we're also going to take that up a level and talk about the internet and how it works. The internet is a group of networks that work with each other, passing information along, handing it off, moving it along. So those are the main components, input, output, system unit, storage device, communications. And here's some of the components. You don't see this very often, external modem anymore. Although you may have something that's called a modem that's connected to your cable or satellite or your phone line. But um, mostly we don't see them in computers so much anymore. And, and they are something um, which converts the digital signal of the computer to analog and then back to digital. And it helps you communicate, and it's outside the computer. The computer also has network cards inside of it. Um, here's a card reader. Helps you read. Usually photos is where these started. Now, of course, it's music, MP3s. They're called files. Scanner, peripheral, 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 peripheral. Peripheral, they're all at peripheral devices. OK. This, anything outside of this, again, is a peripheral. This is your system unit. <clears throat> and this is an important slide, because um, it, the con concept of computers is that they're dumb as dirt. OK? They're very inefficient. Humans can make leaps in logic, get from here to there. Not, we're not sure how we get there sometimes. We just know that it's right, and we can spit out an answer. Six times six, we don't go through a process. We know what that is. We just say 36. Computers never get to the point where they can do that. They have to actually compute six by six by doing, uh, adding six six times and getting 36. That's how a computer multiplies. It doesn't actually multiply. It adds six six times. Not very efficient. Dumb as dirt. However, they're so fast that that's OK. They think so much faster than human beings that it's worth it to us, even though they're incredibly inefficient with how they do things. Keep in mind that your PC and most computers can only do one thing at a time. One, they, can, they execute one instruction at a time. So although you're playing music, surfing the internet, typing in a Word document, um, watching a video all at the same time, it appears to you as the human being that it's doing them all at once. It doesn't. It takes turns. It runs instructions uh, for your browser, the network communications. It runs those instructions. Next, next, it runs the instructions that runs the Microsoft Word program or whatever word processor you use. So you can type things. Next, it runs the, your MP3 player, your audio, net tune or iTunes or um, Spotify, whatever you use. And next, it runs your video. That's a lot to do at once, but it's possible. But they're happening one at a time. They're just cycled through the processor so fast that to our slow human brains, our brains are pretty fast. They just don't, not as fast as the speed of light, which is what a computer does. To us, it seems like they're all happening at once. <clears throat> so the speed is an incredible attribute. There's nothing a computer can do that a human being can't do. Nothing. This is the difference. A computer can do it so much faster than we can that it's worth it to us. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. Nothing a computer does that can't be done by a human being. But the speed of the computer makes it worthwhile to us. Reliability. Well, if you think about human employees, just to do a little personification here, an employee is, it, the reliability of employees varies by employee. Those of us that manage people understand that. Some are more reliable than others. And the human beings also get sick. That's part of the equation when you talk about reliability with human beings. Or human beings have to go to weddings. Damn it. Those darn employees have to go to weddings or funerals or vacations. Jeez. From a, from a purely objective 
standpoint, that makes human beings very unreliable. What if human beings are just angry that day? And they're not as efficient as they were yesterday. Or what if they're upset that they didn't get a raise, so they're not going to work as hard today? This is all part of being a human being. And it's what makes it worth being a human being, all of these things. But it makes us, in an objective sense, unreliable when compared to a computer. A computer never needs a vacation. A computer never wants to go to a wedding. A computer never is sick. They may break down. But if they're in operation, they don't run differently one day and differently the next. They don't get angry and so work slower one day. They don't have a headache, so work slower one day. They're incredibly reliable. They're going to come to work every time you plug them in and turn the power on. They're going to work. That's a reliability that's a powerful thing. It makes computers useful to us. The fact that they're so reliable, no matter what, if I can turn my computer on and get my keyboard and start typing and working with it, I can get my work done, whatever that work may be. I can find the information I need to find. I don't have to worry about a computer taking a vacation. And they don't break down that much, let's face it. We get upset when they do, or they, we yell at them and say, I hate this computer, when it's usually user error that's causing the problem. Not always. Sometimes it's just dumb software. But you get the idea. They, they're very reliable. They're always there for us, so to speak. Consistency. Well, if you can get a computer to print out a receipt at a grocery store, it will do that the same every time. It will be that consistent. It will always create the receipt if it has the, what it needs in terms of paper, ink, data, products to scan. Once you get it working, it works very well. Now, to get it to print a receipt properly takes a lot of testing and human interaction and programming and more testing and more programming. But once you get it working, it's always going to work in that way. That's the beauty of a computer, consistency. Once you get it running properly, you can step back and let it run itself. Is that true of human beings? Well, no. You can have two com human beings compute uh, your taxes, and they're going to get two results. A lot of reasons for that. You can get computers, two people making, um, processing a bunch of numbers, and get two results. You can get the same person doing a same doing addition of 827 numbers. One day they'll get it right, the next day they'll get it wrong, because that's a lot of numbers. So human beings, although they can do anything a computer can do, it's difficult for human beings to be consistent every time. Why? Humans make mistakes. That's just a given. Humans make mistakes. And another aspect of consistency is this term, GIGO, which stands for garbage in, garbage out. So if you as a human being give the computer the wrong input, or you write the wrong process or write the wrong program, give it the wrong instructions, remember the computer is just a hunk of metal, just a hammer. If you don't know how to handle that hammer, if you're not hitting the nail properly, you're going to get garbage out. So what you put into the computer is what you get out. The computer is not smart enough, although you can have it edit your data and say there's something wrong with this data. It's not quite right. I can't process it. That's a good thing. But ultimately, the computer will give you bad output because it doesn't know the difference. Okay, So you have to be careful, again, the human aspect of this. You have to, you, you've seen people that use hammers for a career. They can hammer something in in about three hits. It takes me 272 hits to the same hit nail. It's a matter of if you get the right processes, the correct data, it will always be the same. It's consistent. Human beings can't say that. We make mistakes. Computers do not make mistakes once you have them running per correctly. The downside is we often can find, realize that doesn't look quite right and, and go back and fix our errors. Computers really can't do that very well. They'll just give you the wrong answer and move on. Storage, this aspect, you know, we have storage in our brains and we can store things. But this idea of storing data, it's becoming ever more important these days as we capture more and more data. A lot of our economy is based on storage. Facebook. Google, Yahoo now, they depend on 
keep collecting data on the people using their software, using their computer systems, their information technology. That storage is crucial. Sales data is analyzed continually, something called analytics. Uh, it's nice for you to know what you sh did last year with your credit card or when you paid your last mortgage payment. Um, you can store photographs and pull them up. It's just the incredible um, aspect of computers is the storage. We can keep data forever and, and access it later. This is something that is difficult when we go back too far in history and we're trying to automate a lot of things. One of the things Google tried to do for years is digitize the whole Library of Congress and they got it so that it would be accessible online. They're doing it for free. They just felt it was something that should be done. And they got a lot of pushback because there were people who said, what about copyrights? What about the authors? What about... So they've kind of backed off on that, but, they, but they're still working on it. But um, county courthouses, they're trying to digitize old birth records. <clears throat> Some people track their ancestry and they're trying to digitize um, um, birth certificates, death certificates, and, um, military enlistment rosters from the Revolutionary War, so forth and so on important things to do and, and not an easy process. You can get the image into a computer and retrieve it, but getting knowledge about that scanned birth certificate, reading the names on it, and being able to search on that name and the date and, and the hospital name and those kinds of things are very important. Without storage, a computer wouldn't be worth much if you think about it. It'd be a calculator, right? If you couldn't retrieve the stuff you did yesterday, if you couldn't look at the documents you did a year ago, if you couldn't keep your resume on file and modify a little bit, or your cover letter and modify it a little bit, that's a key port part of, of computers. <clears throat> and of course, communications. Skype is a great example. What we're doing right now today, you watching this recording, me recording it right now live, that's crucial communications going on here. That's a big part of what computers do. These disadvantages, well, I really don't know any of those that aren't also disadvantages just using technology. I'm not sure. This is where people get a little confused. There's a gray area here. There's health risks with anything you do. So I think what they're trying to do is talk about carpal tunnel syndrome, eye strain, those kinds of things. Um, privacy issues, well, we've always had privacy issues. The difference is this, the storage issue. Everything you do is stored somewhere now. So this is more of an issue than it used to be. It's always been an issue. But now, of course, we're so dependent on technology and everything we do is stored because the way Facebook makes money is storing data about our behavior. That's their business model. They sell that information to advertisers. And when they have information about you and other users of Facebook, they get a higher price from advertisers than just putting random ads out there. The ads you see on, space, on Facebook, Facebook, Facebook are tailored to your behavior. And over time, you might notice those things changing based on your behavior. And we'll talk more about that later, but, but there's a vi many people feel that's a violation of privacy. When you go uh, use a frequent shopper card, a grocery store, they keep track of everything you've purchased by that frequent shopper card. Some people feel that's a violation. I, I uh, developed the first frequent shopper card in the Southwest for a grocery chain called Furs, which is no longer in business. But um, we had some interesting things happen. People would call up and ask if we were tracking their alcohol and letting the consumption, letting the state know about it. And the answer is no. Number one, how would we know you work for the state? Number two, we didn't track by name or person. We tracked by the card. We didn't care really who you were as much as what you did so we could do things with it. But many people worry about that. <laughs> and there's a lot of things going on in the news right now about the um, government um, mo uh, monitoring our phone calls, our internet usage. And this happened a few years ago when the Patriot Act was signed a huge building in Los Angeles was built and everything going in and out of the country goes through there and they have computer programs that monitor the conversation. It's been going on a long time but it's becoming an issue now. <clears throat> Public safety, well that's about information I assume um, and we'll talk more about this as we go through but the, 
Um, it's again information, I think. Um, when I was in college years ago, before the web was a big thing, we had a book called The Anarchist Cookbook and the Whole Earth Catalog, which gave us information how to make bombs, how to make poisons, but also how to build houses, electricity, how to generate electricity, how to do all kinds of things. Well, that, was, that book, The Anarchist Cookbook, is seen by some as a public safety. And the similar things are happening now. There's the instance of the uh, Boston Marathon bombings that I'm sure you're familiar with. And those individuals were raised in the United States, but were, as we, the word we use is radicalized by looking at videos on the internet and looking at preachers preaching from Afghanistan, Somalia, and other places. And it radicalized them. And listen to these lectures, and it really made a difference to them. I think there's other things going on in terms of identifying with a culture, and a lot of social issues, and other things going on, and history, and politics, and a lot of things, and religion. But the idea that the tool, the conduit for these things, is the internet and computers and the web, I believe, makes a public safety issue. An impact on labor force. Well. Uh, We'll talk about that, but um, technology itself has had an impact, always has. This technology is having an impact because geography, location, is less important than it used to be. The idea of knowing how to make things and advancing the technology and how to make things is, is, is what's important to businesses now. Where a product is made became less important over the last 10, 15 years, or so we thought. We didn't care. A corporation doesn't really have a country anymore. We treat corporations as if they were American. We, but are they really American? Their, their goal is to give their stockholders returns. They don't care where the stockholders are or how they do that. So they do the cheapest thing they can. And the fact that they can have factories other parts of the world and still communicate and move funds around and, and run the manufacturing from the state or from their headquarters. They can have locations all over and still talk. All those things are related to technology and information technology, which cause and have an impact on labor. <clears throat> the concept of um, infrastructure. The difference between India and China, and China took a hard approach to things, infrastructure, and built roads and electricity, while India looked into the um, intellectual aspects, of the software aspects of things, service. And their economies are built around those things, and it's changed their cultures. And we'll talk more about that. Impact on environment, well, um, one of the things I may ask you to do if you look at the assignment page is to just write a quick paper. I'll, don't, don't, yeah, look at the assignment page. It'll be more specific there. But the idea is that we're storing things up on the cloud, and we have all these server farms, they're called, and the electricity and the heat and the CO2 being generated by these server farms so that we can watch movies on Netflix or Amazon or Hulu, watch TV on Hulu. All of those server farms are having an impact on the environment. And we're trying to figure out ways to make that work a little better. That's just one example. There are, there are things inside the computers that are toxic. And that's an issue. And what do you do with old computers and so forth and so on. There's a lot of environmental issues. but I'm probably not going to talk about too many of them. <clears throat> so there it is. We'll just move on. Um, networks and the internet. A network is a collection of computers and devices connected together. OK. So there's this. This is networked to this. And these two computers are talking to each other. That's, that's great. This one is wireless. So it doesn't matter how you do it. A network is really an idea. You can do it with a cable, or you can do it with what radio. And it's just two computers or more talking to each other and sharing resources. The reason you have a network is to share resources, really. Those resources might be people. It might be information. It might be data. It might be software. It might be a printer. You want people to one printer for 50 people instead of one printer per office. Or you may be sharing Microsoft Office off a network. A lot of different things you could do. So the networks allow us to communicate, but really also to share resources. And of course, they make the internet possible. 
The internet is a worldwide collection of networks, as you can see. So all these networks actually talk to each other. And when you throw, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the internet. When you throw a message on the internet, you're sending it out with an address, believe it or not. It's called an IP address, internet protocol address. And that message, when you type in www.yahoo.com, that message is, Go find this server for me, please. You throw that into a stream or a river, if you will. Think about it in those terms. It floats along that river, and some other network grabs it and says, is this for me? No, it isn't. Well, let's throw it over here, because that's closer to where it needs to be. And it just keeps throwing it on until it gets close to the Yahoo server, and it grabs it, reads the message, says, oh, you want to display our web page, and throws that message back out on the river, and it floats around and eventually gets back to where you are. That's how the internet works. But all these networks act in moving that message around. There's no actual internet itself. It's all these networks working together, it just working in, in conjunction with each other that makes it work. Nobody owns the network, um, although that's becoming less true in some countries like China. The government there is controlling what comes into their country. And we'll talk more about that. But in general, the internet is just a network of networks. And they communicate with each other. And if you, lock to, if you can connect into those networks, you're on the internet. And there are backbones in the internet. We'll talk more about that later. But that's the basic concept. This kind of thing kind of drives me crazy. That's like saying people use hammers for various things. They can build a house. They can build a hospital. They can, I mean, it's just a tool. What you use it for is entirely up to you. There really is no limit to what you can do on the internet. Whatever is out there, you can do. So to say, just try to specify what people do, that's kind of a ridiculous kind of thing to do. It's what do people do with cars? Or what do people do with pencils? It's a tool. You can draw pictures. You can take notes. You can stab somebody in the eye with it. Pencils do lots of things. Listing the things people do with them is just kind of absurd. We understand what a pencil is and what it can be used for. Well, the same is true of the internet anymore. I don't need to list those things. Social networking is an interesting topic that we're all familiar with. But I'm going to really uh, do a whole lecture on this because I think it's changing the way people think. <laughs> it's changing our culture, and I want to see if we can kind of uh, talk about that a little bit and get you to think about along those lines a little bit. Um, you know, I come from a generation before the expansion of the World Wide Web. It was kind of around but not available. And um, now I use it. It's ubiquitous, which means it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's anywhere you go, it's there. Um, my grandchildren, I see, have an identity that's tied very closely to what they do on Facebook. Now, that doesn't mean that's all their reality is, but it's very important to them. I use Facebook just to stay in touch with them and do some other things, but I'm learning about it, and, and it's a very powerful cultural tool, and so is the internet. We're going to talk about that and how social networking is being used to drive business, culture, and a lot of things. You all know what it is. Facebook, Tumblr, computer software. Those are the programs or the instructions, if you will. The computer itself is just a piece of metal that has electricity running through it. And it has a bunch of switches. And the switches can be on or off, zero or one. Based on that, we can do all kinds of things. But the, the driving force that makes the hardware worth something, the hardware is the tangible things you can touch, pick up, carry. The software is little blips of zeros and ones, whether they're stored on a disk or whether they're running on the computer. When they run on the computer, they're copied from a disk into something called memory or random access memory or RAM. And the program actually runs there. The instructions are loaded there. And they're executed from the memory. So the programs are stored somewhere, and then they're run. And the operating system, or OS as I'll call it, is what talks to the hardware directly. 
The application software is a software that talks mainly to the uh, operating system. And the reason that's important is if, if the operating system, if each program written by somebody, if World of Warcraft, if Internet if Explorer, if um, Chrome, if uh, Microsoft Office, if uh, uh, Spotify, if iTunes, if Netflix, all had to talk to the hardware, they would have to write specific hardware instructions into their program. That would make it impossible for us to have the variety of software we have. Instead, we've asked somebody called Microsoft, and now over 93%, I think it's something like that now, down from 98% of the computers in the world run something called Windows. And we have asked Microsoft to serve that function in society. Their business function, their business function is to give us an operating system mainly which talks the hardware. Now it's their headache. Now if I'm um, World of Warcraft or iTunes, all I need to do is learn how to talk to Windows and then now my software will run on any hardware because Windows is worrying about the hardware in the thing. So that's why we have a differentiation. Something has to talk and run the hardware for us and that's what the operating system does. The application software, World of Warcraft, um, iTunes, Spotify, Microsoft Office, all of those things are, are um, Internet Explorer, Chrome, their application software. The, they might, some, you know, Chrome, Internet Explorer might be a utility program. I don't know. There's a gray area there. But they're not an operating system. Chrome also is an operating system, but it's a different piece of software. But the point is application software is what you go buy to run on your system, and you have to buy a version for your OS or operating system. You cannot buy Microsoft Office for Macs and expect it to run in Windows. It doesn't work that way. And the reason is the program is in machine instructions for a specific operating system. Installing is what you do when you put a program on the computer. I assume you all know how to do that. And then there's the other uninstalling which many of us seem to forget when you're not using a program and you're done with it, you should take it off if you're never going to use it again because it frees up disk space and a lot of the good things. But anyhow, everybody knows what that is. Software, of course, the intangibles. So the programmer develops software. A program is just a file full of instructions. That's all it is. And what you see here is a program. It's, this is what's known as the source code. And this was typed in by a human being. What you see in green there are comments for the next programmer or human being that looks at this source code or program to tell them what's going on. That's what comments do in program. Those lines of code is what we call programs, code. Those lines of code in green are ignored by the computer except to print them out so other people can see them. The actual programming language, I'm not sure, I think it's C here. This is not actually a program, it's something called a class. But for now, let's think of it as a program. These are instructions. This part is defining the data we're going to use, or as it says there, declare variables. Here's the actual calculations. And you might say there's no calculations in there. Well, these are subroutines, they're called. And somebody's already written these routines, and you just use them in your program. I'm getting ahead of the game here. Don't worry about it too much. I just want you to get the idea in your head that there's instructions. Then there's an if-else structure. That's how programmers decide what programs do. If this is true, do this. Otherwise or else, do this. So these instructions happen if. I can't read the L. Oh, the L would work is greater than 40. In other words, over, over time, do this. If it's normal pay, do this one, if else, and so forth. The thing about programs, you've got to have things like end, end, end. You've got to tell the machine when the, when the different parts of the program are done. Don't worry too much about this today. I'm just kind of getting the idea in your head that there's something called a source, prog source code, source program, written by a human being, which is then turned into something called a program. And the program itself, which runs, is just nothing but gobbledygook to a human being, machine instructions. So we'll talk about that later. 
one of the things this program is doing is running this program that does this, calculating pay. You'll notice it says, if hours worked over 42. So in, in this case, the hours worked are over 40, so it would do this part, right? Hours worked over 40. And it calculates hourly rate and so forth, OK? That's what a program kind of looks like. Categories of computers. Well, I, I don't talk much about this anymore because it's becoming so a lot of gray areas. Some of these are obvious. Personal computers, something you can have at home. Mobile computers, well, even these are blurring these days. Um, there's a new generation of mobile computers that are kind of blurring the difference between laptop and mobile devices. And this is why I tend not to talk about these things, more about use. Um, now Microsoft created a piece of hardware called a Surface. And it looks like um, a mobile device or a pad, if you will. But it can connect to a keyboard, and now it looks like a laptop. Um, so this area is graying between these two. And I think it won't be long before you're not going to see a lot of uh, desktop computers or even laptops. You're going to see more of these mobile slash um, computer devices. <clears throat> and that's happening because the technology is allowing us to do that, shrinking the, the chips, making them run cooler. A lot of engineering that goes into making it happen, but it's happening. Game consoles, I don't have one because that's all I would do if I had one, but that's actually a computer. I know myself too well. The server, lots of servers in the world. The internet has to have servers to make it work. You have servers at your place of work that runs your network. There's servers everywhere. Most of us do not actually see the servers or get on the servers. I do. I manage some servers. But I mean, most of us don't worry about that. As long as they function, we don't care. Um, but those are things that make sure everything's running in the background, if you will. They, make sh they run the internet. <clears throat> they run your network at work. They allow you to access your email. All of those things. Mainframes, a little bigger. And of course, you know, all this is blurring as well. Let's look. I, there are some pictures here. Desktop, this is the system unit. And a Mac, this is the system unit. It's all put one. The monitor is here, and the system unit is kind of behind the monitor. I have one of those on my desk. Um, mobile computer, that's a laptop. Notebook computer, tablet PCs. But these, again, are kind of boring. Small enough to hold in your hand. OK. Phones. It's a mobile device, but it's also a computer. Um, the computer. Some of the phones are getting bigger. Samsung Galaxies are getting bigger. For instance, iPhones uh, have a pretty big screen. So we're kind of blurring all these things. You know how this is going. You're in the marketplace. I don't need to talk to you about this. This is one, of course, that's probably going away. The most widely known ebook reader is, of course, the Kindle. Amazon created it. And it has interesting technology in that it has liquid paper, or I don't remember what they call it, something like that. And once it draws a page, it doesn't have any more energy to maintain that page. This monitor I'm looking at, probably one you're looking at, I turn the power off. Well, I should say, if there's constantly power making this image appear here, the Kindle doesn't do that, just to give you an idea. But I think these things are kind of fading, because these need to be, move up and be a little smarter for people to make it worth their while. But you're going to see some changes there, too. Ebook reader is probably going to go away soon. Digital camera, well, that has a processor in it. It's doing some things. Probably more as we go down the road. And as you know, your phone probably has a camera in it as well now. Game consoles, OK. You know, now you can get these things, which will allow you, to, if you start a game on a game console, you can then take this with you and continue that game. They're communicating. Here's a server. These are all processors. And then there's storage somewhere off the side. It's storing all kinds of stuff. OK, so share resources. Keep the networks running. Mainframes, OK, it's a large computer. Hundreds or thousands of users accessing this computer at once. Well, this is, of course, although we call them servers, but Amazon has a lot of these because they have a cloud business where they're running businesses on their software. Just in case you didn't know, Netflix 
serves all their videos off of Amazon cloud computers. So their servers and mainframes store all the Netflix videos and do all the processing. It's not as simple as you might think. When you watch a movie on Netflix, several things happen. It, the software somewhere on the Amazon servers decides which server to use, which is closest to your home or wherever you're watching the movie. It, it accesses your, your uh, device, figures out what kind of device you have, what kind of response time, what kind of network connection you have to the internet. And all these things are thrown together and the software then decides which version of the movie to show you from which server. So all those things happen, but it's happening on mainframes and servers. And supercomputers, well, this is what's used to compute the weather, predict the weather. Uh, about a year ago, China, I think, had the fastest computer in the world. But once again, we took that back. We now have the fastest one in the world, an IBM. But most of us don't have access to supercomputers unless we're doing research uh, for somebody. Oh, and it says you can do uh, whoops, a quadrillion executions at once. I hit the wrong buttons here. Hang on. Find where I was here. There it is. I just wanted you to see that word there. One quadrillion instructions. Write that number out. Embedded computers. Well, those are computers that uh, work so closely with the hardware that they're, it's kind of one unit. The hardware, the software, the operating system are all kind of one thing. The uh, Android operating system on your phone only runs on Android devices. So the device itself has to be able to accept the Android operating system. And they're kind of one and the same. So they're embedded and they access just that one device is kind of the way things work. Um, automobiles have them now. A lot of them, anti-lock anti brakes, um, a lot of things. Airbag, cruise control, GPS, all those things are embedded systems. Because they work really, they're specific function and work with that hardware. <clears throat> but this is a crucial part of our life and why computers are becoming more important. The ne next wave of embedded computers, and it's, they're already happening, is going to be in your washer, dryer, dishwasher, refrigerator. And they're going to do things like um, track your usage of your washer. And as it does that, there's going to be some. Um, analysis happening in your washer and it's going to make suggestions to you or it's going to lower the water temperature or it's going to um, use uh, less water or more water based on what it's seen in the in the how clean your clothes get based on the how dirty the water is a lot of things do your clothes dirty that if you work in mud you may have to have a different kind of washing cycle it's also going to collect this data on some level and maybe it's sent back to the manufacturer and used in addition they're going to be updating the software in your washer, dryer, refrigerator, all these things. And it may get used to knowing you're not home at night, or you're asleep at night, I should say. And your thermostat may automatically start cooling the house down for you without you telling it. But all these things are happening right in front of us. They're embedded systems. And they're really becoming part of life. And a lot of it is without our knowledge or consent. Hardware, that's the stuff. The hard things you can touch, feel, walk around, pick up. Software is the other stuff, the programs, essentially, the drivers. And the software, of course, makes this work. Without the software, the hardware is just a doorstop. And then the data, of course, is what we want to have in the computer so we can do something with it. It's that simple. But, and I want to make this point, I've, I've done a lot of systems analysis, design systems, manage projects to develop major corporate um, systems. And all this technology up here isn't the important part of any project to create technology. People that have not had experience with this think they'll go out and buy a program that's going to solve the company's problems and get people working together, all rowing the boat in the same direction. And once we have the software, it'll work. With, that's wrong. The first thing is you have to get all the people to agree to what you want to have happen. And second, you've got to get all the people to agree to what the procedures are. 
until you get these things happening at the same and everybody's understanding and communicating and accepting that when we make a new information technology system, it's going to do these things and these things only, and it's gonna, these people are going to be responsible for this, these people, and so forth. When you get all this down, now you can start looking at this. And what we're talking about is the requirements. What are the requirements of a system? And if you have those requirements, then you can make them happen by getting the appropriate hardware, software, and collecting the proper data, and getting the correct people to tell you if the data is correct. Remember, computers will give you a wrong answer. Well, who is the person after you write the program who's going to tell you, oh, no, no, that's not right. So you have to have test data, test it, and the person that's responsible has to say, no, that's wrong. We did something wrong. We go back to the drawing board. What did we get wrong over here? Let's fix that, because from this grow the programs. That's the idea. Systems analysis is the process of taking this real life stuff. And don't forget, this involves politics, right? This involves personalities. This involves history. This involves relationships. This involves people's feelings. This involves people worrying about their jobs. This involves people wondering if they're going to take a pay cut because you're doing all this. There's all kinds of things going on here. Somehow that gets moved up to here. Now for your home computer, your PC, well, the people that develop the applications programs decide what you want. They get the requirements, and then they develop the program and the hardware accordingly. When a new game comes on the market, that doesn't come out of the blue, right? They do market research. What do people want? They ask people. And, and how do they want it to work? Was there something wrong with the procedures in the last game? Was it difficult to do this? Or was this not uh, clear enough? All those things. Then they developed the game. Then they developed the software. The hardware is usually a given, just the, the basic game platforms. But they have to make it work, and the software does that. So I get, I'm trying to emphasize the point that the hardware, the technology, is the last thing you do, or the second or third or fourth thing. This stuff down here, when you're developing technology, is the important part, the people and the procedures. And people are the procedures. So the, in an information system, in the elements of an information system we have here, an enterprise, that's the way we talk in systems analysis and so forth, the enterprise. But you can see here, um, we develop the procedures, talk to the people. And really, the staff, IT staff, doesn't develop the procedures. The people that are going to use the system develop the procedures and communicate them to the IT staff. The skill for the IT staff is asking the right questions, documenting it in a way that the other people can understand and showing it to them. And then. Um, you enter the data, you process, and so forth. So there's people accessing it from all over is the idea. We'll talk more. I'm going to talk about systems analysis later. You can look through these. Again, the concept here is you, uh, you think about what you're going to do, people, procedures, if you will. And then you say, OK, if that's what I want to do, this is the stuff I need to get. OK? I'm not going to go through those. You get, you get the idea. You can look at them if you want to. I'll make these available. Again, computer applications, well, it's just silly. What are the applications for a pencil? Again, back to what I was talking about. Well, we just use them. They're tools. Computers are tools. We use them in any way we can use them, in any way, in any shape. And we will continue to push the envelope and do things with them that we want to have happen. And when we want to do something that isn't available, somebody will write a program and some hardware and make it happen. So. Talking about a tool like this it doesn't make sense to me. Just one of my bugs. <laughs> my pet peeves. And we're going to talk about some of these as we go through the cultural aspects of, of publishing. As you know, DVDs, Blu-ray discs, um, CDs are really obsolete. Uh, they're, they're on their way out. There's no point in owning them anymore when you can own digital copies on your computer or on a, in a cloud. You can buy movies from Amazon, and they'll be up in your cloud on Amazon. You can watch them whenever you have an internet connection. 
but you don't need the physical disk to do that. And I know most of you think that's kind of odd, um, kind of crazy, because you love having that Blu-ray disk uh, library or the DVD library. Well, I used to feel the same way about CDs. I have over 1,300 CDs, but I haven't bought one in five years because what's the point? I download my music now. My CDs are in a closet somewhere. I can't get anybody to buy them. <clears throat> Even the used CD stores are starting to look at you like, I don't know if I want those. They're hard to sell. So, you know, I better turn them in and get something for them soon. I also have some vinyl LPs in the closet. <laughs> And um, I'm trying to convert those to digital. I've done about 60% of them. I'm working on that. But you get the point. The technology is continually changing the way we live and the way we do things. So these applications do have some impact on society. So we'll be talking about them in that sense. Travel, does anybody, I guess people still go down to the travel agency when they're developing a very complicated trip. But most of us just get our airline reservations online. Even our hotel we do ourselves. Now we may go through a travel agent website, but now if we're going to Disney World and we're going to make a stop somewhere else or going a trip to Europe in three or four different countries, we'll ask the travel agent to help us, but they're often on the internet anyways. I have friends that run a travel agency, but they do it from their home. Nobody really knows that, but it works very well. They do it all online. They never meet their customers. And I'm going to talk a lot, I have a whole lecture on social media and social networking. This idea that we want to communicate with people and get in touch with people. And we want to create a persona in a virtual world. It's kind of an odd, odd thing to think about. But that's essentially what we want to do. We're making connections. And it seems odd to many of us. To my grandkids, it's just a way of life. That's what they do. They're constantly posting pictures when they go to lunch or something. Um, stuff that you and I would assume were private and who would give, care that I'm eating lunch at Chili's? Many of us. Now, I shouldn't say you and I. That's not correct. Me. <laughs> it seems silly. Who cares if I'm eating at Chili's? What they care about, of course, is not so much that you're eating at Chili's unless they, my grandkids and, and kids moved to Seattle and they miss green chili. So when I tell them I'm at uh, Sadie's in Albuquerque, they get a little upset because I'm rubbing it in. They can't eat green chili. Okay. That's different. What they really want to know is who you're with, what the relationships are, what are you doing. Oh, I, I feel like I was almost there with you. I mean, it's a great way to keep in touch with my grandkids. They post things about going to cheerleading practice. They won a game, a uh, baseball game, all those things. So I can be part of that even though I'm not there. But we're going to talk about a little bit on how that's affecting society and changing people's personalities. And this is a picture of what's happening using something called data analytics, they're creating um, diagrams of your connections through social networking, which is allowing them to track how information moves through the social networks, through the uh, web. What that allows them to do is target advertising. What you want to do is find the most crisscross connections that share something in common and advertise your product there. Because those people will carry it forth in more directions. So <laughs> it's a way of life now. Um, Facebook doesn't have any product. They don't charge for anything except advertising. Without these kinds of analytics, they wouldn't be getting any money. They have to prove to the advertisers that it works. So they're constantly tracking your connections. And these aren't just on Facebook. These are connections to websites you go to off of Facebook. They get things off your hard disk that tell them how old you are. What you're, there's a lot of things going on here that you may not be aware of. We're going to talk about those. And of course, a little bit about this concept. I don't really like the term artificial intelligence. But um, most of you probably know this is the ex-governor of California. But before he was governor, he played a cyborg, an intelligent machine, essentially. Um, and this, in case probably most of you don't know, is Hal, who is the computer in the movie 2001 that went crazy. The computer actually went insane and killed one of the crew and almost killed the second one. But the second one, I got removed his memory, so he died. The computer died. And the author always said it's a coincidence that I 
B. M were the next letters in Hal's name. He said that's a coincidence. It makes you wonder. What is artificial intelligence? Well, it's a term. Uh, I don't think there can ever be any such thing as artificial intelligence. Not in my lifetime, probably not in your lifetime. I, I, I just don't believe that it's going to happen. Because to believe that, it is my belief, my opinion, that there's something else in human beings that a machine will never have. I don't know what that is. And maybe I have to believe that just to wake, get up in the morning. Because if I believe my brain and my body is just a machine, then why am I here? What's the point? And, and I, that starts getting into religion and a lot of other things and existentialism. But my point in talking about artificial intelligence is you, you wonder about that. Can there be an artificial machine? Well, I think a machine can emulate intelligence, perhaps, if it has enough facts at its fingertips. But how does it know what the important facts are? Well, that's a learning process. We learn that. We decide what's important to us from the time we're born. If I do this, I get fed. OK, I'm going to do that more. It starts that basically. But then it becomes if I smile and laugh, I feel good. And the people around me smile and laugh. And we, we're, it's, it's a good time. And so forth. Now if I start moving my lips and saying these things, they seem to listen to me. And our machine. Our programming in our brain moves on, but it's, it's predicated on the idea that there's some, something else in there that wants to know, that wants to grow. And we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about the fact that the term itself is a whole field of study and how to get machines to help us make decisions and to operate without us. And whether or not that's artificial intelligence is not important to that discussion. It's the ways we're moving, the research. So we'll talk about those things. <clears throat> And I guess that's all I want to talk about. Um, I also, like I said, there'll be. A, I'm going to talk about why I think this class is important, which will talk touch on some of these concepts. But for now, that's the summary for the introduction to computers. Thanks. And that's it. <laughs>